The Lord be with you. A proclamation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Many of the disciples of Jesus who were listening said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, Does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. While the flesh is of no evil, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the one who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer walked with him. And Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to live? Simon Peter answered, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for the homily. The Supreme Knight, His Excellency Carl Anderson. My brother bishops, sisters, and brothers in the Knights of Columbus, I would like to take also this occasion of addressing you to express with you our condolence for the passing away of the mother of one of the party of the Supreme Knight, Douglas MacDonald, his mother just passed away. In many ways, we are segurista. We want always to be sure. We do not join any enterprise we are not certain about. We would like to know many details. If not all, the pros and cons of the project we are about to do. In fact, this event of the Ninth Convention of the Knights of Columbus had been prepared in detail for many, many months. That is good planning and management. We gather wealth and material things to secure our future. But can we really do that 
all the time. What is it that we should really prepare for? There are so many things beyond our control. For example, accidents, sickness, socio-economic crisis, events that shake our lives, traumatic experiences. We become anxious because we do not know how things are going to develop or end up with. One thing we are sure of, we are alive now and someday we will be gone. As many of our brother knights. In the gospel today, the discussion are in the disciples are in deep crisis. Jesus had multiplied bread and fish in order to feed 5,000 people. And he caused awe among the people. As a result, they wanted to make him king, but he refused. Instead, the eager apostles, he sent them away. Take the boat and cross the sea. Then he tells them that the food that they ate was not important. And that the manna of the desert is not the food they should be looking for. Then Jesus speaks about his bread. He declares that his flesh is real food and his blood real drink. The crowd and many of his disciples find his statements unbelievable, preposterous, unreasonable, intolerable. Their sympathy for Jesus became mixed with reservation. They cannot take what he is saying. And many of them in the end want to disso dissociate themselves from him. They did not anymore walk together with him. How can he give us his flesh to eat? and his blood to drink. What is the use of believing him? Greatly disappointed, many left the company of Jesus. They went back to their homes, and probably some of them opened again their sari sari store, and went back to the security of things known and familiar to them. In spite of this, Jesus does not take back his word. His life and teaching are not easy. He stands for the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Man alone with his human intelligence cannot understand his words. They must have recourse to the Father who will draw them to Jesus, his Son. They must listen to the Holy Spirit who will teach them and make them believe and understand. And we notice that in the liturgy, we are all being prepared for the coming of the Spirit. Will you also go away? Peter here shows the right disposition which we as Christians, as followers of Christ, must have. He represents the other apostles. His words must be our own words. Master, 
to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and we are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. I wish that you will be able to say this in our liturgy this morning. Master, to whom shall we go? When we receive Holy Communion today, let us do it to express our sentiments like Peter. Let us say, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. I believe. And like St. Thomas, we declare, my Lord and my God. One of your scholars, my own priest, just graduated uh, doctor of theology in Gregorian. And he gave me a gift. And that gift is precisely Thomas pointing at the wounds of Christ. Because he challenged Christ. If he is really alive, let him show himself. And Thomas saw him. Jesus appeared to him. I don't think Thomas was able to touch his wounds. Just by looking at it, my Lord and my God. These words ring clear and true as we receive him into our body. We receive him in Holy Communion, not in order that we may assimilate him, not in order that we may make him similar to ourselves, no, but in order that he may assimilate us, that he may make us similar to him. Christian, another Christ. We become Christ's body, and because we are his body, we care for one another. And because we are his body, you knights care for the least of your brothers and sisters, opening up scholarships for the poorest of the poor. You are giving them hope. And because we are his body, we care for one another. FAPI, insurance. Member for member. This is the reason why we love each other as one body, one family, one community, one parish, one church. Please stand. Let us pray to God, our all-powerful Father, who freed Jesus from the bonds of death and raised him to a new life, that he may renew the world by his Spirit and bring us finally to life everlasting. Our response, God of glory, 
hear our prayer. God of glory, hear our prayers. That the Spirit may guide the Holy Father and the bishops in guiding the flocks, especially in the crisis that face the church. Let us pray to the Lord and say, God of glory, hear our prayer. God of glory, hear our prayer. That the government official may be actively involved in finding solution to the needs and concern of our poor brothers and sisters. Let us pray to the Lord and say, God of glory, hear our prayer. that we may not fail to share our earthly bread with those in need and become like the self-giving Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. God of glory, hear our prayer. That families, especially our children, may grow in the ways of the grace through the constant reception of the Holy Eucharist, let us pray to the Lord. God of glory, hear our prayer. That as members of the Knights of Columbus, we may strive to become the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and the leaven of society, by being faithful to our principles of charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism, let us pray to the Lord. God, God of glory, glory, hear our prayer. Our prayer. Heavenly Father, you gave us the body and blood of your Son as food and drink for our journey. Grant that through our union with Him, we may be united with one another as members of his body, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the offertory.
Pray, brethren, that our sacrifice may be made acceptable to God, the Father Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice from your hands for the praise and glory of His name, for the good and good of all His church. Lord, accept these gifts from your family. May we hold fast to the life you have given us and come to the eternal gifts you promise. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Father all-powerful and ever-living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you with greater joy than ever in this Easter season when Christ became our Paschal sacrifice. He is still our priest, our advocate who always pleads our cause. Christ is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever. The joy of the resurrection renews the whole world while the choirs of heaven sing forever to your glory. Father, you are holy indeed, and all creation rightly gives you praise. All light, all holiness comes from you through your Son, Jesus Christ, by the working of the Holy Spirit. From age to age, you gather a people to yourself, so that from east to west, a perfect offering may be made to the glory of your name. And so, Father, we, give, we bring you these gifts, we ask you to make them holy by the power of your Spirit that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate this Eucharist. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, 
which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us joyfully proclaim the mystery of faith. Father, calling to mind the death your Son endured for our salvation, his glorious resurrection and an ascension into heaven, and ready to greet him when he comes again, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look with favor on your church's offering and see the victim whose death has reconciled us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by his body and blood, may be filled with his Holy Spirit and become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make us an everlasting gift to you and enable us to share in the inheritance of your saints with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles, the martyrs, Saint Peter Chanel and all your saints, on whose constant intercession we rely for help. Lord, may this sacrifice which has made our peace with you advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Strengthen in faith and love your pilgrim church honors, your servant Pope Benedict, our Bishop Luis Antonio, and all the bishops with the clergy and the entire people your son has gained for you. Father, hear the prayers of the family you have gathered here before you. In mercy and love, unite all your children wherever they may be. Welcome into your kingdom our departed brothers and sisters and all who have left this world in your friendship. We hope to enjoy forever the vision of your glory through Christ our Lord, from whom all good things come. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Jesus taught us to call God our Father. And so we have the courage to pray.
Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Corpus Christi. In order to have an orderly communion, you can form two lines in the center. And to those staying in the right, somebody will be serving you for the communion, including the left side. Just stay there.
Please stand for the final prayer. Let us pray. Lord, watch over those you have saved in Christ. May we who are redeemed by his suffering and death always rejoice in his resurrection. For he is Lord forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Eucharist has been offered. Let us go to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this point, Holy Brothers, thank you very much, Holy Bishops and Priests. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Praise God for this and Two of our ninth national convention is now in session. May I now call on our Visayas Deputy Rodrigo N. Sorongon to receive the gavel of authority and be the presiding officer for this morning session. Thank you very much, worthy Luzon Deputy and Brother Asinio Yap, Your Excellencies, <clears throat> worthy Supreme Knight Carl A. Anderson and Party, Brother Knights, Ladies, and Guests, good morning. Good morning. Ah, I like that one. Everybody is probably full 
That's why there's a great response. My brother Knights, I'm going to give you a report from uh, the Visaya State <coughs> jurisdiction. And uh, please bear with me. Uh, we do have uh, some slides that we're going to present. And it's going to take about one hour and a half. Oh, Brother Stephen Filer is smiling at me. He thinks that's too much. But anyway, uh, it can either be one hour and a half or ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That picture right there is definitely not me. <laughs> As a worthy Supreme Knight presiding over the Mid-Year Convention in uh, November 17 last year. Uh, in here, in this picture, definitely the three gentlemen or uh, four, five, six, seven gentlemen right here at the back is not me but I will give a prize to those that can identify me somewhere right there in the front later on. So we can always show that slide back again if you feel that you know where I was sitting during that time. That was during the Mid-Year Convention State Deputies Meeting. My brothers, this is how the Visayas jurisdiction looks like in relationship to where the major provinces and regions. As you will note that the regions are divided by water. If you look at it, it takes a lot of money to travel from one area to go to the other. The eastern part is a northern uh, summer area, Beleran, eastern summer, Leyte, southern Leyte. Those are the big areas in uh, the eastern portion of summer. But if you look at it, that area has a lot of potentials for new council development. So, uh, uh, Worthy Brothers, uh, if you look at it, in, in, in uh, Western Visayas, almost all counts, uh, parishes has councils already, with the exception of a portion of Negros Occidental that we still have yet to, uh, to uh, get new councils on the area. So in Central Cebu, also has a lot of opportunity to be able to create a new council and central uh, Visayas. Okay. And these are the officers of the Visayas jurisdiction. Uh, we do have the uh, regional deputies, uh, the three regional deputies on top. And also we have the uh, directors and the officers of the Knights of Columbus in the Visaya section. In the Visayas jurisdiction composed of three regions, naming Western Visaya, Central, and Eastern Visayas. A number of members, 60,000 60, plus, and we have 624 councils. We have 156 districts. We have 28 provincial deputies and three regional deputies. The membership recruitment as of April 26, 2012, we do have a quota of 4,350. We are still short. We have attained only 80.87%, and maybe the Luzon jurisdiction can help us maybe recruit new members here and transfer them to Visayas.
So uh, the new council development, uh, our, our quota is uh, 20 and we have uh, 18 so far. And um, a lot of other councils being brewed up uh, before uh, May 15, uh, probably they'll be uh, done and, and over with. Uh, we do have a quota of 14 from Colombian Squires. And according to our Colombian Squires uh, chairman, he said the organized one is already 14. So uh, we have met that quota. Next. Uh, these are the programs and activities as a whole. Uh, of course, uh, that's the installation of the officers, uh, state officers, in uh, August 20, 2011, and, uh, in Iloilo. And these are the meeting uh, of the uh, district deputies in Negros, and the pilgrimage of Our Lady of Guadalupe was officially launched uh, last. Uh, 2011, uh, and uh, the uh, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Angela de Mayo was the ones that uh, endorsed it and uh, was given to all the councils throughout the Visayan. And that's the mid-year evaluation, and uh, the executive uh, is uh, attended by uh, all the district deputies the provincial deputies and, the three, and also the regional deputies. And of course, we do have uh, the awarding ceremony during that evening and uh, the uh, worthy past state deputy, uh, Brad Yun Esteban, was present. He was the one that gave the award. And the center uh, gentleman right there uh, in the black uh, is Brad Yun Ho, our worthy state treasurer, he is a good dancer. So if anyone who would want to know or learn how to dance, ask him. He's the best dancer throughout the jurisdictions in the Philippines. But walang nagpapalakpak. My brothers, I'm proud to say that when we have that uh, sendong, the uh, calamity that hit uh, the major part is in uh, Mindanao. Uh, that was in uh, December 19. And uh, my brothers, I am proud to say that the, Vis that the Visayas jurisdiction was able to come up in a short span of time, in less than two weeks, was able to come up with 232,000 pesos donation from its council throughout the Visayas jurisdiction. We were able to uh, make sure that we are going to respond to the Mindanao jurisdiction because of it was badly hit. We have 150,000 pesos we brought and delivered to the uh, uh, Mindanao jurisdiction and uh, Brad Balfauni was the ones that received the, the amount, and it was distributed amongst the brother knights that were uh, uh, hit by the victim, uh, that were victims of that flood. Also, back, back. Also, we do have 82,000 uh, that was given to Dumaguiti, province of Dumaguiti, because they were also hit during the time frame. And the magnitude is not that great as compared to the ones in Mindanao. And my brother Knights uh, in Dumaguiti, uh, we do have that meeting. Uh, we were uh, talking about how we are going to distribute the goods because we came there with the other state officers. We drove and uh, we did, made a caravan. We brought the goods. And uh, that's the same day that was given to, uh, to
to the uh, recipients of the flood victims. Uh, I guess we have some portion of the amount that was given and all the other goods that were uh, gathered by the Knights of Columbus in all the areas in Visayas jurisdiction. Okay, this one right here is uh, a gift-giving activity and Christmas party with the families and children in Dumanhog, Cebu. There were about 600 beneficiaries. And I would like to make mention, uh, past Visayas Deputy Phil Pacubas is in charge of this found Visayas Foundation. It's uh, 11 hectare uh, that was uh, procured by the jurisdiction. And anyway, I am going to take this opportunity to advertise. If anyone wants to make a business out of these 11 hectares, you may see uh, Bradfield Pacoba, so that way uh, we can uh, earn something in the Visayas jurisdiction. <laughs> so anyway, that's open for anybody who wants to do business with, with, with that one. So my brother Knights, uh, this picture right here is a day after the, uh, the fire in Iloilo. It's like a continuous thing in the Visayas jurisdiction. It's like a continuous thing. But the charity aspect of the Knights of Columbus is alive and well. In less than two weeks, we were able to gather that 232,000. But this one right here, the following day, they were able to gather goods and sacks of rice, so many sacks of rice, and uh, was delivered the following day right away. There right there is uh, Brad Nuni uh, Nipomusino, he's uh, our uh, program, state program director, and uh, also uh, the granite right there. So anyway, uh, Brother Knights, this is, this fire is in Tansai Lilo, and 300 families were or houses were burned. The Visayas area was shaken by a 6.9 intensity earthquake, and the areas of Negros Oriental was heavily affected. There were various members of the Knights of Columbus who were left homeless. Thus, the jurisdiction initiated a fundraising to address the concerns of the people in Negros Oriental. The jurisdiction was able to deliver the donations amounting to 162,000 to the victims of the earthquake from Luzon jurisdiction. Uh, I mean, Luzon jurisdiction donated 50,000 pesos. Mindanao jurisdiction donated 50,000 pesos. Casey Fapi donated 50,000 pesos and KC Fapi employees for 10,200 pesos. This, my brothers and sisters, is an act of actually following the four principles, and one, and that principle is charity. So that the world may know new hope. Um, that's a part and parcel when we went to uh, uh, Giholngan and La Libertad Council. And also in, in, in Pakwan Council, there are 20 brother knights that their houses were demolished because of that uh, earthquake. And in Giholngan, we have 16 brother knights that were also affected by that earthquake. And we have 150 uh, um, uh, members of the community in La Libertad Council. So we went there personally and we delivered the goods and the money. It was suggested by the parish priest of La Libertad not to give cash. They said, just 
give in terms of materials. So the youth uh, ministry in charge of La Libertad and the granite of La Libertad was the ones that made sure these things happens to the 150 families. Even if we do have not that much money that were, we were able to gather, but we were able to respond as fast as we can. Uh, these are uh, the provincial conferences uh, focusing on membership drive, new council development, council reactivation, and council operation. And uh, if you look at uh, the picture right there, I believe you can see uh, the uh, administrative assistance for region seven and eight. Brad Alan Wano, I guess, is the ones at the center making that big smile. And also, of course, I'm there at the back, and uh, Brad Anthony Nazario right there, the state secretary. And of course, we have the district deputies uh, around of that area, and uh, of course, the members of the Knights of Columbus. And also, this is one, also a portion of that provincial meeting that was held in Metro Cebu uh, during that time frame. This is a simultaneous march for life. My brother Knights, I know the, uh, the, uh, the order is fighting for not to support that RH bill. So, in terms of that, we were able to make a march for life was held in regions of the Visayas, a total of 6,000 nights and some pro-life activists joined the march to show their support to the pro-life advocacy of the Knights of Columbus. This one, this picture right here, uh, was taken at the provincial capital in Iloilo. And this was taken in Negros. Uh, uh, there, uh, simultaneously during that same day, it was taken, that was taken in Negros. The ones in Cebu and the Eastern Visayas was not incorporated on this. So my brothers, uh, the assembly district and council activities, also it did say supported the construction and maintenance of the church. This is, I believe, would focus on some councils that are helping the church. And Brother Knights, just to let you know, that is our obligation, uh, part and parcel of that. And also the sponsored Paris Roundtable conducted meaningful vocation program, participated in life of the Paris, and also hosted a Paris Rosary service. That's the community activities, if you look at it. There's a, a, a clean and green, a tree planting, a feeding program, and bloodletting. That one right there is a family activity and initiated mass weddings and sponsored a program to assist widows and families of deceased members. And during the, uh, uh, held a memorial mass for the deceased members the, during the All Souls and All Saints Day, and sponsored the marriage vow renewal mass and participated in the family of year entry and sponsored a family social, socials and fellowship. And on the youth activities, we have organized and support the Squire Circle, of course. Uh, you can read that. We also have participated in drug awareness poster contest and participated in Casey soccer competition. And those are the youth, the squires. In assembly, this council activities conducted membership drive, published a monthly council newsletter, started council website, Sponsored Columbus Day and Council Anniversary 
created a certified degree team. In here, my brother Knights, the goal of the Visayas jurisdiction is to ensure that we do have a new team or a team for every council. The initial goal of the jurisdiction is to have a team per district. And eventually will boil, boil down to a team for, per council. So that way, my brother Knights, we will be able to, to respond in a quick manner to be able to get those membership coming in. So my brothers, That's basically uh, another uh, portion of this is coming from Bacolod or Negros. So my brother Knights, that ends my report for the Visayas jurisdiction. I'm happy that I was not able to reach the goal I have for one hour and a half speed. Worthy Visayas Deputy. The Visayas State Advocate is recognized. I move that <clears throat> The report of the state of the order in the Visayas jurisdiction be approved. Any second? It has been moved and seconded that the report on the state of the order in the Visayas jurisdiction be approved. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. <laughs> May I call on His Excellency, the Most Reverend Angel in Lagdameo, Archbishop of Haro, and the State Chaplain of Visayas to make his remarks. Please all stand. Please be seated unless you want to listen to me standing up. <laughs> Your Excellency, the Supreme Knight, Carl Anderson, my brother bishops, my brothers in the Knights of Columbus. The theme that you have chosen for the Ninth National Convention of Knights of Columbus is so that the world may know new hope. The reports, the excellent reports that we have listened to since yesterday and just a while ago show that how you have lived in an excellent way the theme so that it may not anymore be necessary for me to comment on. You have been bringing new hopes to the people whom you have touched. Your theme reflects the Easter message of Pope Benedict XVI. And I read 
Christ is hope and comfort for those Christian communities suffering for their faith on account of discrimination and persecution. And He is present as a force of hope through His church, which is close to all human situation of suffering and injustice. Through pictures that have been presented here, you have seen what you have been doing, what hope you have generated in people you have touched with your apostolate. But at this moment, I want to be a little bit different. I have no reports to make. I would like to look at your theme on hope from the aspect of theology. Hope is the inherent capability of man as man. It is linked with, founded on, and based on the promise, which is based on the activity of God as God. Reading through biblical stories, the hope expressed by Adam, by Abraham, by Noah, the prophets, the Israelites as a people, Peter and Paul, etc. Their hope is but a response to the prior promise of God. The theology of hope is founded on the theology of promise. As long as there is a promise, you generate hope. When one, one fails to fulfill his promise, you generate disappointment, despair. Man has the possibility of hoping because God took the initiative to promise. God's promise to work in the future is more important than what He has already done in the past. The focus on future based on God's promise does not, does not imply a withdrawal from the world of the present but working with hope in the present situation. Negative, problematic, and critical as this situation may be, a better world, a better Philippines will still somehow develop and evolve. The theology of hope advocates active participation in the world in order to speed the coming of a better world. The Christian is to be seen as a hoper, someone who is impatient, someone who is terribly dissatisfied with the current status of the world, someone who is dissatisfied with the current situation of our country. The theology of hope makes eschatology its central governing concept and is properly and ultimately understood with the resurrection of Christ. Our hope cannot simply rely upon a future that at some point becomes present and then becomes past. Hope is here understood as an ongoing advent, a journey into the future stage by stage in which all events are dynamically in process sustaining and carrying the believer through life's varied circumstances. And so we read in Peter, 1 Peter, 
Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who in His great mercy gave us new birth, a birth unto hope which draws its life from the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As I was preparing this, I actually tried to look for a verse because I do not like the guest speaker yesterday that Bishop Davide had more scripture quotation than I have in my talk now. Our hope in the resurrection changes us. Our hope changes our world. Our hope can change our country. This hope brings into the process of fulfillment the promise of God culminating in Jesus Christ. By believing, by hoping, by loving, we do not get stuck in events that have already taken place. We do not get stuck in the glory and successes that we have reported during these two days. Instead, we enter into the process of bringing the seemingly endless future into current, ongoing fulfillment and current experience of the resurrection of Christ and the coming of the new kingdom. Reflecting on the history of our country, we see that we have gone through series of degeneration, disasters, and wars. We have been tested in many ways by many forms of governments and many forms of leadership. Individually and communally, we have gone through many struggles and difficulties, but we have always been hoping that better times are still to come. Better times are still to come. And it is true. Our story is not finished yet. In spite of the experience of the many successes that we have made, our story is ongoing. Ours indeed is not a history of failures and defeats only, but also of successes and victories. We are a people of living hope. The best is still to come. With us, through us, the world will know new hope. Thank you very much, His Excellency, the Most Reverend Hangel and Blag the Mayo. Let's give him a big, big hand. <clears throat> May I call on His Excellency, the Most Reverend Romulo T. de la Cruz, Bishop of Kedapawan, in the Assistant State Chaplain of Mindanao to make his remarks. Please all stand. Thank you. Please be seated.
Archbishop Lagdameo ended by saying that we can strive to work for more success and not be happy with failures. My dear delegates from Cebu, I have just received a text message saying that Region 12 of Mindanao at the pre Saam meet, which finished yesterday, lost 3 to 2 to Cebu soccer team. Congratulations, Cebu. But I texted the priest who gave me the message, silver still glitters, not just the gold, so congratulations. <laughs> Supreme Knights and his party, Brother Knights, I wish to thank Sir Knight Arsenio Isidro Yap, Luzon Deputy and Convention Chairman, and all those behind organizing this convention for inviting me and giving me a chance to address the Knights from all over the country. It is not every day that one has the chance to witness a national gathering of Knights of Columbus from all the four corners of the Philippines. All of you must find a renewed fellowship in your cause as you exchange notes with each other on how each of you, in your own peculiar way, have lived out the inspiration behind the organization that we call the Knights of Columbus. Surely, after this gathering, you will be better emissaries of the new hope that you would want the world to know. And what should this new hope be? Allow me to hark back to what the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, reminded the Knights of Columbus almost four years ago when he exhorted the board of directors during a private audience on October 3, 2008, to strive for growth in holiness. In that exhortation, the Holy Father pointed out that the holiness of each night of Columbus should find expression in at least three ways. First, in the work of charity that knights participate in at the local level. Second, in the prayers and sacrifices that the knights bear witness in the parishes of the various districts. And third, in the exercise of leadership by the knights when they unhesitatingly stand by and defend the Christian moral truths necessary for a free and humane society. Charity. When the knights of a local council provide for and are consistently present in the feeding of malnourished school children, or when the knights are the first to respond to the flights to the plight of flood victims or refugees, as we heard in the Visayas report, refugees from armed conflict. A clear message is delivered to the community, if not to the whole world. That message will be heard more clearly than if it were delivered in spoken words, namely, that Jesus is to be encountered not among the rich and famous, the affluent and powerful, but among the poor 
and the powerless. The works of charity done by the knights teach the young more effectively than any catechism class could ever accomplish that Christianity is about service to others and that to be a Christian is to strive to be the number one servant of mankind as Jesus Christ was. Prayer. When the knights of a local council organize and take turns in manning a 24-hour vigil before the Blessed Sacrament, or when the knights are consistently seen as taking leading roles in the liturgy and in parish processions, the unequivocal message sent to all, young and old alike, is that prayer is of utmost importance so that it must be attended to individually as well as communally. The visible presence of the knights in the prayer life of the parish goes a long way toward heightening in the consciousness of others the need for some form of a spiritual life one that lends itself to silence, allowing for self-examination, all of which prepares and predisposes every Christian to commune with his or her God. Moral stand. When the Knights of Columbus organize a march for life, to call attention to the plight of the unborn, often unwanted and nonchalantly aborted, society is afforded a chance to reform and to renew itself. When the Knights of Columbus speaks out against those who denude our forests, who poison our rivers with chemicals, pollute the air we breathe, our whole planet is given a second chance to survive despite the wounds it has already sustained. There are many more moral issues on which the Holy Father says the Knights of Columbus should not hesitate to make known their stand. Why? Because silence and neglect on these issues only serve to weaken the foundations of a just and humane society, and without any moral foundations, mankind cannot long endure. In making moral stands on the crucial issues of mankind, our organization, just like the Catholic Church, can be met with apathy or opposition or worse, persecution. But stand up we must if we are true to our faith and sincerely love mankind. What is asked of the Knights of Columbus, be it works of charity or active participation in the prayer life of the church, or standing up for the powerless and defenseless among God's children is nothing less than heroic holiness. You know full well that when you take the side of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, very often you have to take a loss. You trade off a convenient and easy life for one that is unpopular maligned by the wealthy and powerful, and one that relies on and rests under the shadow of the cross. And so, my brother knights, I say to you today, on our second day of this national convention, you have chosen to make known to the world the new hope that is called holiness. May our founder, the Venerable Michael McGivney, accompany us and intercede for us 
in our quest for holiness that is alone the hope of the world. Thank you and may God bless us all.